Hey, so I'm Sam from Prismic. I'm here with Rich Harris from Svelte. Thanks for being here, Rich. Thank you. And so now we're talking about one of my favorite subjects, which is content. I mean, every developer deals with this. You're building some sort of an application, and then you might even just have like the text for a button. You might have a whole blog. You might have a, you know, whatever, a glossary. You need to figure out where to put that content. And that's a hard question. Now, uh, in the web development world today, Nuxt, Astro, Eleventy, they've all come up with uh, specific features for how you should handle content. Uh, Svelte, so far, as far as I know, doesn't have that. How does Svelte think about content? It kind of is left as a problem for the application developer to solve to a large extent. And the reason it's possible for us to do that is because things like Prismic exist. And we can sort of say, you know, here are the here are the primitives and people can build integration layers between them. And so, you know, if, if you are uh, building an application that has content that is stored in Prismic, then you can, like there's a, a page in your documentation that you can follow and, uh, and it just works. That's not to say that that's necessarily the ideal scenario. Like Svelte's whole thing is that things should be built in. If you're going to need them, then they should be part of the framework. They should be built in in a, like an, an opinionated and, and first class way. And we're not very intellectually consistent about what is included in, in that rubric. So, you know, we have lots of things that are part of Svelte that are not part of other frameworks, but we don't have any any, any opinions on how you store your content, how you do authentication, like where your mm -hmm. data lives, all that sort of thing. And I think one of the ways in which the framework will probably evolve over the next few years is starting to have some of those opinions. Um, there's been a big debate raging in the web development world recently about um, the meaning of full stack framework and, and whether any of the current crop of front end frameworks, Next, Remix, Feltkit, all of these things, qualify when you compare them to things like Laravel and Rails, which yeah. have been around a lot longer and have um, a lot more opinions about how to do stuff. And I would say that content is part of that conversation. Like, does it belong to the framework or is it something that should be and almost needs to be kept separately so that you can allow for different um, solutions to emerge and for, for people to do experimentation mm -hmm. that wouldn't be possible within the confines of the framework itself. So all of that is a long-winded way of saying that we're kind of we're, we're happy with the fact that people can do basically whatever they need to do today in, in Svelte and SvelteKit, but there are definitely conversations that we want to have about how we can make it more of a built-in thing that if you're building an application in SvelteKit, then there is a place to put your content. So it's kind of up for discussion right now. It is, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, and, and it's partly just a, like a question of, of bandwidth and priorities. You know, you mentioned Astro and Eleventy. Um, they are frameworks that are very focused on content. Astro sort of identified a gap in the market. Mm -hmm. A lot of the existing front-end frameworks were, were focused on how do we build applications that can like do all of these crazy things? And they were under focusing on this basic, like I, I just want to put a blog post on the internet. How do I do that? And so they very cleverly came along and said, here's how you do that. Nuxt is sort of the everything framework. They will just add every feature they can think of. And that includes, um, you know, storage and content APIs. Right. And so it, it's natural that that those things exist because they've had the bandwidth and they have the priority and we're just we're just not there yet. Yeah, yeah. I am gonna take a moment for our obligatory product placement mention. Uh, Prismic is a CMS and if you would like to see what it's like to use content with Prismic in Svelte, you can check out our quick start here. Just go to the dashboard, create a new repository and just choose Svelte as your framework. Um, but having said that, <laughs> and in a completely unbiased way, feel free to answer this however you like. If a Svelte developer comes to you and says, hey, I'm working on an application, I need to add content, what are you going to tell them? Markdown. My, I'm, I'm a developer. I, I like uh, Markdown files because like, they're part of my repository. They're, mm -hmm. they're subject to version control. They're on my machine so I can work offline. Uh, I'm, I'm not worried that the password is, is going to get lost or that someone is going to have permissions that they're not supposed to. Like, everything is in one place. 
I can use command line tools like grep. I can find and replace. I, I want all of that stuff. Um, unfortunately, the, the way that things are today, that doesn't make the content all that accessible mm -hmm. to non-developers. For the kind of things that I work on, that's not really a problem. Like when I'm dealing with content, it's things like the tutorials in learn.svelte.dev and most of the people who are looking at that are also developers. And so if they have edits that they want to make, then they can just click on the link to the, the Git repo and they can propose changes right then and there. But that's not true for most people who are authoring content. So you know, most people who are authoring content don't want to deal with merge conflicts and, and other things. So there needs to be obviously uh, a, a friendly, mm -hmm. ideally WYSIWYG way to mm -hmm. People can interact with it, um, and so that I, I think is like the gap between uh, the world as it exists today and the world that I would like to see is it would be great if there was better tooling that allowed people to work with um, content on their local machines um, in the way that CMSs like Prismic allow people to work today. So, um, what would you like to see um, CMSs? or maybe even specifically headless CMSs, what would you like to see them focus on? So I I think the, the last decade or so, there's been like the advent of, of the headless CMS has been like the story has been sort of decoupling of content from presentation, which is obviously the right direction to go in. And I think what I would love to see is a further extension of that idea where the there is a decoupling from the data and the tooling that you use to, to work on on that data. Um, like I would love a world, and not just in CMSs, but in web apps generally, where I own my data, I control it, I control where it lives, I control who has access to it, um, and the tool is granted permission to operate on that data. So you can have the collaborative tooling, you can have the WYSIWYG editor, you can have um, all of the, the things that like the added value on top of the data that um, the applications provide, but you know, I the data is portable, and mm -hmm. I can write scripts to operate on the data on my local machine, and like all of those sorts of things that just aren't really part of the toolkit today because we have this very strong bias towards um, services that control both the application and the data. You, like you, you don't have to think about it. Yes, which, you know, obviously is like it's that way for some good reasons. Like it's very convenient if if the service controls the data. Um, but I think partly it's more a, a question of inertia and this is just how the way things are done. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I would be very excited to see some more um, experimentation in, in that arena. One example, I'm wondering if this is sort of in line with what you're describing. I use ImageX for my personal projects where they provide the interface uh, for ha for um, handling your images, but they're stored in AWS. Mm -hmm. Is that kind of the direction that you're thinking? Yes. Okay. Yeah, very much so. Um, except, you know, replace AWS with X where mm -hmm. you control the X. Yeah, absolutely. I think that's a really cool vision of how this could work. I want to steer back a little bit to content and specifically um, something that you said, I think in one of like your big talks um, maybe some years ago is um, if you want to become a better programmer, a good way to do that is to practice writing prose. What did you mean by that? I, I think what I meant, I'm, I'm trying to cast my mind back to uh, exactly what point I was trying to get across. But, you know, a lot of the time when you're writing prose, you are essentially solving a problem. Like you can't introduce concepts until um, until you're ready to describe them. Um, you can't like refer to something that you haven't yet um, explained what it is. Um, which is, you know, it, it, it's true in programming too. You can't reference a variable before it's been declared. And I think that uh, when I look at really elegant code, I often find that the author of that code is someone who writes really well as well. Like they're really good at articulating ideas. And that is fundamentally what writing code is. You are articulating ideas. You are taking something and turning it into a representation that a computer can understand. 
And that requires you to be able to understand what the thing is and to articulate what that thing is. And that is a skill that is inherent in writing as well. Um, people tend to think that code is, I don't know, somehow more numeric and mathematical, but it, it, it's really not. It's, it's, the, it's the art of describing something mm. in a language that something else can understand. Yeah. Um, and it, it just so happens that when you're writing code, the target audience is, or one of the target audiences is computers. Mm -hmm. Obviously, another target audience is your fellow programmers, <laughs> and that includes your future self. And the more succinctly and elegantly you can articulate what the piece of code is trying to do, and I don't mean just by having comments, although comments are obviously part of this, but I mean in terms of the code itself, um, then generally in my experience, the better and more reliable and more robust the software itself yeah. becomes. Yeah, and I would also add to that, you said that your uh, the people reading the code are computers, your fellow programmers, I think something we're also incre increasingly trying to be conscious of when we're writing HTML is that the code uh, also has really important meaning for screen readers or, or um, search engines or AI or people who are accessing that, uh, that code in different ways. Yes, which you know, obviously makes the, the task of building web apps uh, a lot more complicated than it otherwise would be. Um, and that that stuff is a little bit more invisible. Mm -hmm. um, it's hard to think like a search engine. Um, if you're a, a person with you know, without visual impairments, it, it's hard to imagine what navigating the web is like mm -hmm. um, if you do have visual impairments. Um, and so that is a place where I think frameworks and tooling like have a lot of opportunity to make our lives easier yeah. by, by nudging us towards better outcomes. Mm -hmm. Um, but yeah, it, it's all part and parcel of like having empathy for for the consumer of the thing that you're making, whether that's another human or a search engine crawler or a, um, yeah. or, uh, or, a, or a computer. And whether you're writing a headline or a blog post yeah. or, um, or HTML or CSS. I really like thinking of it that way, like especially thinking of code as literature because it is something that we write and that people read. At the same time, um, obviously we know that there is uh, also a line between code and content. How do you think about that line and, and, and where it falls? Personally, I'm, I'm, I'm bad at it. Um, I'm not very disciplined about separating code from content. And I think the thing that forces people to become good at that is internationalization. Because mm. the minute you need to start thinking about, well, I can't just put the text literally inside this button element. Like it, it needs to be something that is drawn from a file with a bunch of translations. Um, then you probably start to develop a, a slightly more rigorous approach to how, like, how you draw that separation. Um, but I also think that it's it's not like in most things in in life. It's actually not a clear cut boundary. Um, you know, I spent much of my career um, in journalism like working on code that would create graphics and, and interactive displays of data that would be part of a story. And the ideal that we were always striving for is not that here is the writing and here are the graphics, it's that the two are integrated, that the, the content and the code kind of flow in and out of each other, and it's a little bit more of a fuzzy boundary. Um, and so I, I find it helpful to develop the muscle of, of, of resisting those sharp delineations um, and thinking more about the shades of gray in between them. So internationalization is a good litmus test, but you still try to keep your mind open to it being a fuzzy boundary. Yeah, and that extends to, you know, where do these things live? Like I, I talked earlier about um, my personal preference is for the content to be in markdown files that are part of my repository. Um, obviously, that's not how content management systems work. Like you have your data over here, and you have your code that consumes the data over here. Um, but like, there's there's lots of options in between those, and like levers that you can pull. Um, some of which are more ideal for some mm -hmm. situations than than mm -hmm. others. Um, so yeah, there's there's fuzzy boundaries everywhere. Last time we. Last time you spoke with Prismic, with my colleague Alex, um, the title of that video, which you can click on here, was uh, Web Development is um, 
too damn hard, I think. Um, and I think that's still really true. And especially there is a very high barrier to entry for non-technical people, which you mentioned. If, you, um, if you're managing content in Markdown, it's going to be really difficult for uh, you know, your great aunt to update that website. That being the case, when somebody with no coding experience today asks you how to make a website, what do you tell them? Oh, wow. Um. <laughs> and I ask this in the spirit of like, you know, the web is fundamentally content. It's, it's something that we kind of aspire to have accessible. You know, everyone could be, should. We would like everyone to be able to put content on the web, read content on the web. Yeah, I mean, it, it really depends um, how much time they have and, and what their goals are. Um, like the simplest version obviously is, I don't know, you make a Facebook page. Mm -hmm. um, that's a, a very accessible way to put content on the web. And that's why so many businesses have chosen that option. Um, if you're just looking for a place to put your thoughts, then you know Twitter is is a perfectly fine place to do it. Medium is a perfectly fine place to do it. These are places with significant drawbacks. Like you don't own the content that you create when you do it that way, and you don't have any control over where it ends up and and, and so on. Um, and so, if people have time, then you know I I, I always want to try and teach people the basics of oh, this is how you. This is how you use HTML. Like, look, this is a human readable and writable language that we've been using for, for decades now. Every time you open a web app on your phone, it's it's downloading this human readable and writable language. And you can just use any old text editor and, and you can make it yourself. And that is a remarkable thing. Most people <laughs> don't have the appetite to learn that. But um, but for those that do, it's it's, I think, a really exciting realization that all of these things are like there's there's no yeah there's no magic there's no um, like secret club that you need to join like people can learn HTML yeah I was googling uh, where the names of the days of the week come from the other day and I came across a pure HTML website from 1995 and I was so happy there it is it's still on the internet you know I don't know if it's maintained or whatever but it was like Times New Roman white background mm -hmm. and I was like yeah we can do this. Yeah, yeah, we've strayed a little, a, a little bit far from the path. Um, people don't tend to think in those terms. People, I, I think, have been a little bit captured by the various platforms that exist. But it's totally possible. Is that something you think about with Svelte, closing the gap between coders and non-technical people? It, it's certainly part of the motivation. Yes, um, I mean the the, the reason that. Uh, that I, I built it primarily was, uh, as I say, so that we inside um, newsrooms could build applications. A lot of the people who work in that environment are like super smart people who don't care about programming. Um, and a lot of the things that we use in the front end world in particular are built for people who care very deeply about programming. Um, and so I, I think if we can make if you can give more people the ability to produce interactive content on the web, then that is an excellent goal to strive for. And obviously there's a, a very long way to go. Like we haven't yet made web development simple enough that anyone can just pick it up. But that is the direction that I think we should be striving to go in mm -hmm. for sure. Where do you see that in the future where anyone could throw up their own personal website and own that data, like you're saying. Uh, I mean, I, I think it's 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 partly on framework teams like ours to to make it um, easy to turn your ideas into a description of those ideas. Um, I think there's also um, like the problem of of where do you where do you host this stuff? Um, I work at a company Vassell that makes this like straight straightforward for people mm -hmm. um but e even even there there's like an expectation that you're putting your stuff in a git repository and then you're yeah. connecting it to your project on on Vassell. um and and i think we can probably push even further in that direction too um and obviously there are, you know there is these websites that are explicitly designed to allow non-technical people to put content on the web but there tends to be a pretty low ceiling of what you can do on those platforms. And for me, the ideal is 
something that is as easy to use as that, but that scales with you. As you grow, yeah. as you develop more skills, then you're not bounded by what the platform developers imagined. You're bounded by the technology itself. And yeah. web technology is, is pretty boundless. I actually had someone just last month come to me and say, hey, I have some HTML files. I need to serve them for iframes. Um, I need an easy way to put them on online. Do you have a recommendation? And it was, I did a lot of research to find like just an easy UI where you could upload an HTML file and serve it, you know, on a whatever, a random URL. Um, we've talked a lot in the web development world about simplifying complexity. Do you think we have a problem with complexifying simplicity? I, I, I think we do. Um, I don't think it's, as, it's quite as, as bad as people make out. People often say that developers love complexity and, and that's not my experience at all. Like I think people sometimes fall into a complexity trap, but I think most developers, especially once they've been developing for a little while, really do gravitate towards simplicity. At least that's what, what I've observed. Um, so I, I don't think the problem is a love of complexity or, or we're falling into a trap of, of, of making things more complicated than they need to be. I think the problems that we face are um, a lack of time. Um, I think we have a, a, a tendency to say, well, this is just how it's always been done and not challenge the status quo enough. And I think the biggest thing is probably just, th th this will sound um, harsher than, than it means to, but a lack of empathy with people who have not yet made the leap mm -hmm. to, to where we are. Like there are certain things that we take for granted that people should absolutely not have to take for granted in order to be productive on the web. Yeah. Like version control is an obvious example. <laughs> um, there, are, there are so many of, of these of these barriers that we just don't see. And it's in, instructive to be around people who, who are not versed in these things yeah. just to get a, reacquainted with <laughs> you know how how many layers there are that you need to work through in order to to get to where you want to go i feel like what i'm hearing is that you're optimistic like you feel like everyone's um everyone's got the best intentions and we're kind of moving in the right direction we're definitely moving in the right direction people people tend to be very pessimistic about these sorts of things um people tend to be very nostalgic about you know the the old days of slinging files up to ftp <laughs> servers and, and whatever and the reality is we are getting much better at all of these things like mm -hmm. we are you know nowadays you, you you don't you don't need to be able to administrate a linux server in order to to run a website yeah like there are much much simpler ways um and it's becoming much cheaper to to do these things than it used to be yeah. so in in every along every dimension these things are becoming more accessible, um, but the project is very much unfinished. Cool. Personally, I've been creating a lot of content-rich websites with Svelte and SvelteKit, and I love it. Um, obviously, uh, Prismic is one option for this. If you want to give it a try, um, you can go to prismic.io slash dashboard, sign up, create an account, uh, create a new repository, and you can choose SvelteKit as your technology, and it will guide you through the onboarding process, show you everything you need to know about how to make a website with Svelte and Prismic. Other options too, you can use Nuxt or Next. Um, uh, there's also options for that in the onboarding info, uh, and you can find more information about that in the description below. Um, um, Rich, thank you so much for talking to me about this and for all the work you've been doing on Svelte. Um, the future is exciting. Yeah, thank you.